my god, it's so I know, right? You're probably like, what the fuck? You haven't uploaded a fucking jackass, you piece of shit! You fucking worthless piece of fucking shit! Yes, I know, I am back. I had a rather unpleasant summer and fall, but I am definitely here now, and I will continue to be this time for sure. But regardless of everything, I have been keeping tabs on the world's events. Naturally, Russia and Ukraine, China's ambitions with the world, such as their political endeavors with Taiwan, the COVID protests, and their recent clash with India. Yeah, Xi Jinping is uh, going to do something rash to hold on to his power soon. North Korea has been showing off as well, and even nearby Serbia is threatening to do something in Kosovo. Man, <laughs> the world uh, really is going to shit, isn't it? 2022 really has blown away all the other previous years. But anyway... Uh, should any bad scenario arise, there will be one other front that must be waged, and in some form it already is, here on the media. Ever since February, we've seen very little people speak in favor of the West's adversaries. South Front is gone, RT is no longer visible here, Russia Insight is gone, even our friend Nathan Rich has only recently returned after his own hiatus. I wondered, is there anyone else out there? Well, uh, I was recommended a certain somebody, and holy hell, is he something in these times. Right? The Arabs are so violent. Oh, the Arabs are terrorists. That's all you hear. This garbage, this, this racist, trash, imperialist nonsense from CNN, from the Israelis, from BBC, over and over for decades. I'd like to introduce you to Richard Medhurst. Uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Here on the internet, he's a political commentator and independent journalist. Even though he doesn't really have a degree in journalism, meaning he majored in economics and social sciences, but this guy uploads every day, like literally every day, and the rhetoric is exactly what you would expect. This guy has over 1,600 videos, and some of his videos can essentially be refuted without even making a full video in response. Personally, there is so much of it that I didn't even know where to begin with. But on the bright side, I don't have to make full videos of it. Since um, the new stage of our troubles started in February of this year, let's review all the juicy videos he's made on geopolitics since then. Okay, so his first video with that is just laughable, as he begins to contradict himself a month later. But the even funnier one is the one where he hosts a talk show about how NATO cannot face Russia. Uh, but you don't want to go to war either. Um, you know, there, there, there needs to be, the West needs to establish some serious red lines like the Polish border, the Romanian border, the Baltic states, and be prepared to defend them with force if necessary. And, you know, the West is having a major wake-up call because NATO has allowed its military capability to, uh, to, to rock. For the last 20 years, the United States has been you know, I, uh, killing right. goat herders and kicking down doors in the Iraq. Uh, we can't fight the war that, that that's being trans, you know, that's taking place right now. What the Russians are doing is just stunning. The Russians are unleashing the kind of hell that um, a modern combined arms military is capable of doing. NATO's got nothing that can stand up to this right now. Well, considering that they can't even take over Ukraine, I can tell that he doesn't know what he's talking about. So uh, what else do we have? Uh, is the invasion of Ukraine the worst thing since World War II? Far. So far, we've heard that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the worst thing to happen in Europe since World War II, right? Like, let's just casually forget NATO bombing Yugoslavia. And, and then we've heard that Russia going into Ukraine is, is the biggest threat to world security. And it's, it's the darkest thing that's ever happened in Europe and ever happened in the world. And Mitt Romney and others saying that it's the first time in 80 years that a country, a, a power has invaded a sovereign country. Like they're just erasing the hundreds, if it's it, hundreds of coups, invasions, attacks that the United States has done against other countries. Like you're literally in Syria right now and you're occupying Syria. You, you have supported, Romney supported the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Have you gone fucking ballistic? Well, yes, uh, the invasion of Ukraine is the worst considering the scale of destruction happening. The war in Ukraine has the potential to become a world war. Iraq, Syria, hell, even Yugoslavia or Chechnya or Georgia haven't reached that scale. And the worst part is that this is still ongoing. I think uh, this will get really bad for a lot of people. And if you ask me, uh, I think this war will become a global war at some point. I mean, is it a coincidence that tensions are rising in uh, Taiwan on the Korean Peninsula 
uh, even in the Middle East and even here, like, you know, close to me in Serbia. I mean, all that stuff all together at once, uh, I don't think that's just a uh, coincidence. He also points out that China is supporting Russia in this. Like, no shit. I even called this before it even happened. And he mentions China again here. So China has called for restraint in Ukraine and rejects the term invasion. So Russia, uh, sorry, uh, 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 China doesn't accept that what Russia is doing is an invasion. And so what you're seeing here is not China refusing to get involved and trying to tow like a more, you know, um, ob objective or neutral or, or let's say uh, an, an unbiased position. Really? China's drone company DGI supplied drones to Russia. They introduced new trade deals and they supply Russia with microchips to help produce uh, missiles. A Hong Kong based company was found to have supplied Russia with microchips and regular flights between China and Russia have been recorded reportedly carrying millions of dollars of microchips. Are you really going to claim otherwise? <laughs> Got <he. laughs> Ooh, I almost forgot about this. This Ukraine crisis is really a mask off moment because you are seeing the implicit hypocrisy, how they have so much outrage and the whole world is defending Ukraine, but they said nothing about Iraq and Syria and Libya and all of these countries which they destroyed. They want to support Ukrainians' right to resist. You know, if, if you want to take up armed resistance in Ukraine, that's totally fine, right? They're even going to go and crowdfund the weapons for you online, and they're even going to come and fight with you. The United States has announced that it will be taking in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. So uh, this is from the New York Times. And uh, the, underneath it says, with European nations under stress from 3 million new refugees, the U.S. said it would substantially increase admissions of people fleeing Russia's invasion. So again, as you guys know, the number of people who have fled Ukraine in the last month, it's three, uh, over 3 million. Uh, 2 million of them are in Poland, in neighboring Poland. And uh, the United States says it's going to take in 100,000 people now. Refugees from Ukraine, they've, they've got 100,000 places, uh, 100,000 spots. And th I mean, this is incredible. Uh, you know, the responses to these tweets <laughs> you know, perfectly encapsulate what I'm trying to say. Someone quote tweeted this and says, tu vois quand tu veux, which means, uh, which basically translates to, ah, see what happens when you actually want to do something. Because what we've been hearing the whole time from the British and from the French, you know how they, d they demonize uh, uh, refugees that are crossing the Mediterranean and then the channel, uh, you know, letting them drown, uh, telling them that, uh, you know, that they're uh, basically going to keep them in these camps like the, the, the jungle in, in Calais. I mean, they, you cannot deny that they've been treating them horribly. And again, I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not buying this garbage that, oh, well, they're not refugees because they should have stopped in the first safe country if they were really refugees. That, that is not a law. You made that up. That the Refugee Convention, 1951, says literally nothing about stopping in the first country. Does Richard not know how to read? Article 26 of the very convention that he stated says that they must apply for asylum in the first country of arrival. Not only that, but it's also repeated for us Europeans in the Dublin regulations. Refugees cannot go asylum shopping all over the world as the term says it. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, will Europe freeze without Russian gas? Really? As much as I can see, European storages are well stocked and Europe is already building new energy facilities and securing new trade deals. Hell, they even have one with Canada. It looks like uh, the video I made all those years ago is coming true. The visit includes meetings about a number of issues from the war in Ukraine to climate change. On the final day of the trip, the leaders are in Newfoundland. There, it is expected they will sign a deal making Germany a key customer of Canada's hydrogen energy sector. Biolabs in Ukraine. Well, another claim made, but no proof given. And here we are, almost a year into the invasion, and uh, no biological weapon has been unleashed. Unless you want to call COVID a weapon, like how the Chinese did. So, moving on, I've come across a conspiracy theory I've never heard of. The green screen conspiracy. So th this video went viral on uh, social media because it's Ukrainian President Zelensky. Uh, he, he's, you know, delivering a message uh, on video and people think that he's using a green screen. So, the, you know, it's raised all sorts of questions like, where is he? Is he? Because uh, I can see counts of other videos where he walks outside, raw videos of him on the front lines 
and even meeting other world leaders. Just a question for Metkers. Where is Putin? Is that video of him meeting Russian recruits fake? You, you, speaking of, because of, uh, this goes along the line of self-defense, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about Article 51 of the UN Charter, because, yeah. um, uh, again, for the viewers, those who don't know, in the UN Charter, uh, Article 51 pertains to the right to, to, to uh, self-defense, so right. either individual or collective. And uh, I, I uh, saw your, your great piece in Consortium News. I saw some of your tweets as well. And, and th this is a genuine question that I have because, you know, I see the, the, the United States and Israel invoke Article 51 when they bomb Syria or they bomb Iraq. Um, no, no one seems to mind that. Uh, here, Russia also invoked Article 51. If I'm not mistaken, you, you believe that uh, they are correct to do so and they have the actual legal uh, justification to do it. Um, uh, wh why do you think so? How, like, uh, you know, how, how can we rationalize and reconcile this with, uh, uh, with Article 51? Because the rest of the world, or let's say the Western world, says Russia's violating international law. Is it really? Like, I if it's invoking Article 51? Well, yeah, it kind of was illegal, as Ukraine never did attack Russia. Yes, the U.S. has done horrible things, and I believe that they were violating international law when they invaded Iraq or Libya or when they attacked Syria. Even the legality of the Iraq war has been refuted. Kofi Annan even said that the U.S. invasion of Iraq was illegal. What aboutism is like the main argument that these people use? They think the U.S.'s wars make it perfectly okay for Russia to do the same thing, especially when they deny that stuff like this happened. Ukraine has made this whole thing up. They're saying that it's a false flag. What I'm going to do, and again, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know <laughs> how freely I can speak on here. Uh, I'm going to try and give you both sides of the story, and you make your own mind up. Okay, I think that's the objective. That's a fair thing to do. Um, so, again, obviously, I'm not going to show you any of the pictures because they'll be flagged immediately. It's quite brutal. I don't think any of you want to actually, like, trust me, if you see that, you're going to wish I didn't show you. It's bad. It's very bad. Basically, they've been... They've been trying to prove that this happened by showing satellite imagery, right? So again, like I said, Russia uh, has come out and said this is this is not true. And what you've had is major outlets releasing satellite imagery like this to prove that it is actually true. Because they're saying that if you can see the bodies by satellite, then obviously they're there. Seen pieces like this uh, coming out and saying that you know there's there's evidence that um, it's a lie because. The mayor of, of Bucha uh, announced on March 31st, he filmed like a selfie video. And, and on March 31st, he said the Russians have left the town. So basically, the, the Russian side are saying, how is it possible that Russian troops committed a massacre when Russian troops left four days ago? That doesn't make sense. Like, did nobody see these bodies that are laying on the street? Because there are so many of them, right? That's the... And, and yeah, there, there are bodies in the street. That's, there's no question about it. Like, uh, it's, it's actually, it's horrible. Honestly, like, you know, regardless of who did it, like at, at the end of the day, these people were killed. That, that and is very horrible. It's really heartbreaking. You have a pattern of many years, many stories where uh, the, the Western press, they, they lie and make things up. They, you know, they, they don't just tell like tiny lies. They make astronomical lies, you know, enormous, enormous lies. Uh, like Iraq, like in Syria. There we go. More whataboutism and one that says that Iraq was worse than Ukraine. Are we really going to compare dozens of deaths to hundreds of deaths? Yes, the US committed war crimes in Iraq, but they at least acknowledged them and brought the perpetrators to justice. Russia doesn't even acknowledge the stuff it did in Ukraine. Я называю это спецоперацией, поскольку это миротворческая операция, есть разница между войной и спецоперацией, поскольку основной задачей специальной операции является именно сберечь жизни мирных граждан, остановить геноцид, который происходил на протяжении многих лет, к сожалению, на Украине. Но если военная операция в Украине нацелена на то, чтобы сберечь мирных граждан, на, 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 ну, за, на мир, то как же так? тогда, что сотни мирных граждан уже погибло там в этой операции. Российские вооруженные силы не убивают мирных граждан. Российские вооруженные силы, вы можете видеть абсолютно массу всевозможных роликов в интернете, достоверной информации на официальных аккаунтах. Не доверяйте, пожалуйста, фейк-ньюс. Мы видим ролики, как бомбы падают на Харьков, на Суми, на Киев. 
на российские вооруженные силы не применяют оружие против мирного населения. Задача российских вооруженных сил состоит в том, чтобы принести на Украину мир, чтобы Украина сама могла выбрать нормальную, легитимную власть. Okay, let's see the other stuff over the course of the war. Like, I remember the day the Moskva sank. Richard made a video about that too. The Russian flagship, the Moskva, has apparently been sunk in the Black Sea. So they say a Russian warship that was damaged by an explosion on Wednesday has sunk, according to Russia's defense ministry. So uh, Moskva, the flagship of Russia's Black Sea fleet, was being towed to port when, quote-unquote, stormy seas caused it to sink. Um, the 510 crew missile cruiser was a symbol of Russia's military power uh, uh, leading its naval assault on Ukraine. Now, Kiev says its missiles hit the warship, and the U.S. says it also believes it was hit by Ukrainian missiles. Uh, Moscow has not reported any attack. It says the vessel sank after a fire. Honestly, I don't know, guys. I, I, I really don't know. Those, are, those things are not mutually exclusive. Obviously, if you hit a ship, there's a very good chance that you get to start a fire on board. That's, that's not uncommon. Even if the fire was started by a Neptune missile hitting it, that would still mean it was sunk because of the Ukrainians. <laughs> Lol. Ooh, of all the things that has piqued my interest in this escalation, Sweden and Finland joining NATO interested me the most. Richard has done a few uh, videos on that topic, and I can tell he is not too happy. So Finland and Sweden are considering joining NATO. Sweden and Finland, traditionally, they've uh, described themselves as not aligned and um, as neutral countries, very much like Austria, right? The difference is <laughs> Austria is not considering joining NATO. Although in this climate, I wouldn't be surprised because people are saying that, well, you know, Putin screwed up. Russia's whole point was to go into Ukraine and demilitarize Ukraine and, and you know, basically show it who's boss and, and, and tell it that, you know, we're not going to tolerate uh, NATO expansionism and we're not going to tolerate, uh, you know, NATO troops on our doorstep, U.S. biolabs on our doorstep, pick whatever one you, you like. The fundamental reason here, you know, even if you had zero Nazis in Ukraine, that's obviously a huge issue. Um, but the fundamental issue is NATO expansionism, right? And it's nothing to do with Putin. Like, I... I again, I don't know how old... <laughs> Um, people are. I don't think it really matters. You can pick up a history book. The Russians have been talking about this since before Putin was, you know, ever before anyone ever heard of Putin. Putin was a nobody when the Russians were talking about, you guys need to back off. You need to take NATO away from our doorstep, right? So that, that's number one. And people are saying, well, if that really is Russia's primary concern, <laughs> they've screwed up. Because now, instead of deterring future NATO um, membership, they've actually, you know, they've basically forced Finland and Sweden to rethink their, you know, non-alignment, non their uh, stated neutrality, and to actually join NATO. Is that true? I don't know if that's true. Because if you look at the map, look at how many countries joined NATO since um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because remember, this is very important. NATO was created in 1949 with one sole purpose, which is to counter the Soviet Union. You see, he doesn't even know how to say it, so he's just trying to word it out, you know, rather slowly and trying to think of a way to make it sound negative. He's even saying that Russia's invasion pushed the two to join, but sort of sprinkling it with bad accusations, uh, such as uh, saying that they would have joined anyway. All in all, that is the case, Richard. Putin proved that NATO still has a purpose, but NATO isn't the only alliance that our indie journalist despises, it's the Pacific alliances as well. You have a bunch of US senators who, to provoke China, they, they took a trip to Taiwan. I made a video on this already, technically Taiwan is that one China, so I would say they are right to go there. The US has always had diplomatic relations, albeit not always official with Taiwan, and they've been selling weapons to them for years. The only difference now is that Xi Jinping faces economic and social problems at home, and so he wants to shift the focus onto something else. Okay, I see Richard really doesn't like Ukraine. Joe Biden has announced another $800 million uh, worth of weapons for Ukraine. And in this entire 20-minute video, he never makes the point of the title. Why you fail? Wait, what? This really made me laugh. I thought it might give you a chuckle as well. 
Joe Biden announced that he wants to make the uh, the military more environment friendly, right? Because that's just what we need. It's not less wars or less, you know, uh, uh, U.S. military bases. Eight hundred is clearly not enough. No, no, it's it's <laughs> environment friendly imperialism. Well, I do believe that there should be fewer wars, but seriously, Richard, are you a climate change denier? I've always wondered what his thoughts on economics were, and he does touch on it. Like, are sanctions on Russia working? Hmm, I don't know, you tell me. Or can Poland and Bulgaria survive without Russian gas? Yes, they can. <laughs> this guy echoes a lot of Krembots by calling everything Russophobic. People are like social justice wars, attempting to cancel culture everything that is apparently phobic to these people. Well, this one is a little less laughable, but easy to refute. So Joe Biden basically uh, threatened war with China, and um, <laughs> the White House tried to walk back the comments and kind of soften what he said. Uh, let, let's take a look at this. He didn't threaten to invade China, he just threatened to defend Taiwan, which has happened before. He, he really likes to talk about refugees and how the West has to pick up the brunt. It kind of goes in line with the idea of a book that I really hate. What? Russian influence? Like, no shit, Sherlock, that's your entire channel. Huh? How? And you don't have to worry about them anymore. You know, you know this, the, you could look at it this way. You know this phrase in English, the saying, uh, keep your friends close, your enemies closer. And in terms of the United States view, you know, if Russia is your enemy and they're applying to join NATO, just take them in NATO. I think it would have been very smart. You would have avoided, you could you know, have avoided any sort of war between um, the two countries with the most nukes. I don't think anyone denies this. So Nancy, you know, what, what she hasn't furthered U.S. policy, except you could say that she's further muddled uh, already chaotic U.S. policy. The U.S. doesn't have a sound, firm policy on Taiwan. Uh, you know, we, we have, you know, the 1979 Taiwan Act which uh, commits us to a one china policy imagine that we are committed to a one china policy yes and taiwan is the original china so yeah there is only one china well demilitarization is taking place as we speak <laughs> now this is made more complicated by the fact that russia is now you know required to destroy tens of billions of dollars of um, additional equipment that's being uh, you know poured into Ukraine by the by the West uh, on a daily basis. I, you know, every day you hear no, another nation's providing them with more SU-25 fighters. Another nation we're providing them with, you know, hip helicopters. Uh, another nation, 200 tanks. Another nation, 400 APCs. Another nation, 60 artillery pieces. That's a heck of a lot of equipment. And uh, it's being received by the Ukrainians, absorbed, and then sent to the battlefield, and then Russia has to destroy it. If you think about it, Russia has not only destroyed uh, the inventory of the second largest military in Europe, which was the Ukrainian army, trained in NATO standards, equipped with modern equipment. They not only destroyed that, but they've now destroyed basically what amounts to NATO's strategic military reserve, because NATO has been pouring in all of its reserve capability to, uh, to Ukraine, and that's being destroyed. Now NATO is being tasked with coming up and giving up its operational capabilities. And this is a different question altogether. I mean, NATO's given up so much ammunition right now that if NATO were to go to war with Russia, they'd run out of artillery ammunition in 14 days. Um, and the Russians will never run out of artillery ammunition. So, you know, <laughs> the, war ends, the war ends at that point. Uh, really? The Russians are relying on tanks from Belarus and drones from Iran. They're also relying on artillery rounds from North Korea and microchips from China. Let's also not forget that Russia has a smaller economy than Italy. If anyone is going to be running out of resources first, it's going to be Russia. They even try to repeat that same thing here. So there you go. Let, let's, let's never forget the fact that there's a lot of well-trained, well-motivated, professional Ukrainian warriors out there who are hooking and jabbing with the Russians on a daily basis. So... Uh, I, I think I, I bring that point up just to underscore the fact that the, the combat that's taking place in Ukraine is real. This ain't mm -hmm. fake. This isn't this isn't some Call of Duty, Medal of Honor video game. This is real between two professional militaries. And the Ukrainians, if, if the Russians make a mistake, they'll learn the hard way the Ukrainians mean business because the Ukrainians will kill the Russians. Um, but here's the other point I wanted to make. 
the fact that Russia is dominating the battlefield, uh, getting kill ratios of up to 20 to 1 against this professional force, what's that say about the Russians? And uh, anybody in the West who's sitting there saying, ah, oh, the Russians are nothing, we can beat the Russians, NATO can beat, no, we can't. The Russians are better than we are. Uh, the Russians have perfected the art of war in Ukraine. Uh, their combat formations are as finely tuned killing machines as you could ask for. They're not perfect. They make mistakes. They suffer casualties. Are you sure about that? Because uh, by the time of this state, the Russians were pushed this far back. Not a lot of technological superiority on Russia's side. Hell, they even threatened to bomb Poland in an attempt to stop Ukraine from getting Western weaponry, especially since their weapons are getting rusty. It's more or less the same for China, and he even tries to defend them too, again. You're going to have the same thing with what's happening in Ukraine, where basically you're going to have the United States and the mainstream media and the corporate media and the West kind of re really just launching an enormous campaign to rally support behind Taiwan, just the same that they're doing now, right now with Ukraine, okay? And they're going to do this. They're going to use Taiwan in a bid to uh, escalate with China, to start a war with China, to whatever it is. I, I, you know, when, it, when we say these phrases, start a war with China, I mean, you know what that means. That's like Armageddon. It's game over. I don't want to know what, a war, what is a start a war with China. That's not an option. But nevertheless, we live in a crazy world, right? These people are nuts. What a way to victim blame. China invades Taiwan, and yet they're the defenders. Lovely logic. Especially when he says that the euro is worth less than a dollar. Yeah, I'm beginning to think this guy is illiterate. Not only that, but he's in denial. Partial mobilization in Russia. So President Putin has announced um, a mobilization of up to 300,000 troops. There are whispers that actually the number is much higher because there's a section in the order which is classified, uh, blotched out. I'll play you the video, though, of him announcing mobilization, and then we'll get into it because this is a very, very serious topic. We have uh, um, people saying that a bunch of the units that are turning up are completely ineffective. Uh, I think that's more propaganda than than truth. I'm not saying it's completely false, because when you mobilize 300,000 people, obviously not every single one of them is going to be fit for duty. But I think it's more like discouraging the Russians um, and, uh, and, and so on. I want to go back to the speech where Putin said that they're doing this to protect the homeland, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, and that they're facing the collective West. I agree. I agree. Uh, here's the quote. He says, in fact, the entire military machine of the collective West. He's right. That is what is happening. When you pump 50 billion, I mean, 50 billion is a goddamn understatement, man. When you pump all of these, these weapons from Germany, from the UK, uh, you know, from Poland, from the Americans, uh, not to mention the lend lease, which is its own beast. You have all this military might of NATO, you know, crammed into Ukraine. Ukraine probably has more NATO weapons than actual NATO members. Ukraine is honestly more of a NATO member than actual NATO members. I would definitely, definitely agree that they're facing the entire military machine of the West. Absolutely, there's no question about it. It kind of is because Putin strictly said that this was not a war, but just a special military operation. Starting a partial mobilization is a step closer to actually admitting that this is a war. It's a step back from what was originally planned back in February. Okay, I knew, I just knew he would comment on this. The Ukrainian president, uh, Zelensky, he's now applied for fast-track membership uh, to join the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, right? So, uh, let me just play you this clip quickly here, where he's um, signing the paper in front of the cameras, right? That's more than Russia, by the way. So... Now, you, now Zelensky wants to join NATO, and, you know, we come to the crux of the issue, which is that the expansion of NATO has always been a problem for the Russians. What a lot of people fail to realize is that Ukraine was a neutral country. In 2010, they adopted a non-alignment policy, which said that they wouldn't join any alliance. They only dropped that policy at the end of 2014, when the war in Donbass was already ongoing. Now they apply to join NATO? No shit they did, considering that Russia annexed former regions of their territory. You know, NATO should thank Putin. He is so paranoid about NATO that he ended up becoming its best salesman. 
Montenegro joined NATO because of Putin. So Sweden and Finland are also joining. Now Ukraine is joining too. And based on what the Russian Navy is doing off the Irish coast, I would love to see Ireland step up to do so as well. Just quite amazing. But uh, it's not amazing when Richard says this. So there's this new claim from Russia that the Ukrainians are planning to use a dirty bomb. And when I saw dirty bomb, the first thing I thought of was was Iraq, because I remember back then on TV, you had this claim in the UK and the US that, you know, oh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction and he has all these variants, right? He, he can cook up uh, anthrax and bubonic plague in the back of a truck like Breaking Bad. You know, uh, he, he has underground facilities and he's also planning on giving it to Al Qaeda and he has dirty bombs. So that's a bomb. Uh, uh, with that contains radioactive material okay and now turns out this isn't about iraq it's about russia and ukraine we have had a couple of escalations in the war the crimea bridge was blown up with a truck bomb the Nord stream pipelines were blown up and sabotaged and all evidence points to these being man-made events and to being therefore sabotaged and perpetrated by ukraine the Ukrainians basically admitted that they blew up the Crimea Bridge. I have the video of the foreign minister of Ukraine literally saying that on tape. And before that, we had the SBU, the Ukrainian uh, uh, security services, basically admitting to it the day it happened. Zelensky as well. They, they, they joked about it in a way that indicated that they, they were behind it. And like I said, the foreign minister of Ukraine himself on tape saying we blew it up. What more evidence do you need? It was Ukraine. So, you know, again... Truck bombs, Al-Qaeda-style truck bombs, are in now, all right? They're in. <laughs> Very fashionable these days. You have several significant escalations in the war, acts of sabotage, and Ukraine was behind them. So, logically, who is most likely to be behind a dirty bomb? Just logically. Really? The Russians are having their asses handed to them in Ukraine. Why would Zelensky need to order such an attack when he can basically accomplish everything through conventional means. If anyone is going to order a nuclear strike, it's probably the Russians because uh, they might uh, feel the need to resort to it. This guy's logic gets worse every time. One of my favorite ones is in this video. Let's just take a quick look at this video. Um, the 101st Airborne Division, also nicknamed the Screaming Eagles, it's uh, a famous uh, paratrooper. Uh, division in the American army that was formed during World War II, and apparently they've been deployed now to Ukraine's border. Man, it, so it sounds so tacky. A show of force for America's allies and enemies alike. Okay, yeah, yeah, you, you got very big cojones. Well done. So, I'll give you Scott Ritter's comments on this um, uh, NATO nuclear drills, because keep in mind, for the last two weeks, roughly last two weeks, They've been holding um, uh, this uh, Operation Steadfast Noon. It's basically a nuclear drill, okay? They're simulating, they're, they're doing a rehearsal, an exercise, military exercise um, of, uh, uh, you know, NATO, basically NATO's ability to wage a nuclear war. And, I mean, just think of the ramifications. It's like, imagine if Russia came to, I don't know, let's say, let's say they came to uh, somewhere near Canada with you know nuclear bombers and about 30 other countries and held a, a, a drill there of a simulation with you know a, a, a simulating a nuclear war with the united states put yourself in the shoes of the russians just one second and think like how how threatening that looks how did you expect things would go russia would invade ukraine and no one would care further prove putin's lunacy before 2014 nato forces weren't even stationed in eastern europe all that was in response to Russia's adventurism in Ukraine. Of course, NATO's going to station troops in Romania to protect the eastern flank. This isn't a conspiracy, Richard. Oh, and in response to this hypothetical question, Russia has conducted drills in North America. There have been hundreds of cases where Russian bombers were intercepted over Alaska and Canada. That is something he got wrong. It's also worth noting that he got this wrong, too. But what do you make of the Crimea bridge attack? Because that was another huge event that took place since the last time that you and I spoke. And, you know, on the day that it happened, uh, the Ukrainians practically were, you know, they, they were they were glowing and, and boasting and, and uh, you know, uh, showing off about it. Uh, Zelensky, the uh, uh, SBU. Uh, so, uh, you know, do you think they, they were helped... Um, with that attack too, with that operation, 
if you're going to do something like this, I can guarantee you that you don't first time you drive a truck using the film disguise technique over the bridge isn't during the attack. It means there had to be rehearsals. It means that somebody had to drive this truck over the bridge with something that wasn't a bomb wrapped in film to see if they would get stopped by the Russians or not. Um, and, uh, you know, but now, now, now we say, okay, on that day, they felt good. They were all taking selfies by the big time stamp. Uh, ask the Ukrainians how they feel about it now. You know, because the Russians are driving over the bridge. The Russians are sending rail traffic over the bridge. Uh, the Russians are repairing the bridge. Yeah, they fixed it quite quickly. The Ukraine's power grid's out. People are living in the dark, queuing up for water. How many are taking selfies today? How many Ukrainians think that that was a good trade-off? I think it was one of the dumbest things Ukraine ever did. Um, but and this war is one of the dumbest things Ukraine ever did. What? The attack on the Crimean bridge has temporarily taken out a supply route. The Russians already have a lot of logistical problems. This attack is going to make it even worse. Now the Russians will have it worse when trying to resupply their troops. After this, he makes less stuff on Russia and China, as he knows that a lot of the things he's saying are stupid. The most recent video he made was this. This is such an important point. I'm going to read that, that uh, donation again. Quote, the Nazis also got inspiration for ethnic cleansing and colonialism from American exceptionalism and manifest destiny. There's a lot of British uh, philosophy that influenced the Nazis as well. Knowing what happened to not just the natives, but, you know, the, the enslaved Africans that were brought there with the triangular trade. He should be criticizing the whole system uh, instead of what he's doing here, which just comes across as cringy as hell. Yeah, there we go. Forget the fact that every country that exists today has a violent history. It's America that has Nazis and started Nazism. Never mind Russia taking over Siberia or the Qin Dynasty forming what is today China. No, it's only the U.S. I think you get how this stuff works by now. You don't even need a degree in journalism to become an actual journalist, apparently. Just grab a microphone, start a podcast, because that's an easy way to reach out to people. I stand by what I said in that all news outlets are at least biased in some degree, and people like Richard Medhurst are proof of that. It shows how basically anyone can become the media, but the worst part of is that some channels don't even try to hide their bias. They just openly show it, and yet they claim that they aren't biased. Just like uh, this guy right here. 